you mentioned Muammar Gaddafi and Kwame Nkrumah, and these were among the key players in you know having a United States of Africa. So briefly for our listeners, can you give them a, a quick history on uh, the roots of Pan-Africanism, obviously who were involved, I mean, including Gaddafi and Kuruma, and what needs to be done right now to move towards a more united African continent? Well, so I'm almost sure I mentioned before that Africa is moving towards unity. The African continental free trade area, for example. Addis Ababa, uh, Ethiopia is a, a headquarters for Pan-African unity. That's where the African Union is located. Uh, I think I mentioned last time that uh, China had just built a new headquarters for the Africa Center for Disease Control, which is bad news for Ebola and bad news for COVID-19, but good news for the health of Africans. And so you already have many of these transcontinental bodies, but I, I think what happens is that people, people are ignorant. You know? they, they have, I don't know where they get these ideas from, but they have, they have a, what usually happens, people have a fixed set of ideas that are impervious to news and facts. And so many of them are not aware of the African continental free treaty. Many of them don't even know about the African Union, for example. So don't know about the African Center for Disease Control, all these others. So don't know about the regional bodies, which I'm sure I mentioned before, the Southern African Development Community, ECOWAS, the Economic Community of West African States, East African East Africa. Complement. So I mean, this, this is happening as we speak, but people, for whatever reason, they're unaware. And there's a saying in the United States, ignorance is bliss. Uh, that is to say, ignorance is happiness. Because I guess if you're ignorant, uh, you don't have to worry about anything. In any case, uh, Kwame Nkrumah, the first leader of independent Ghana in 1957, actually was educated in part in the United States of America at Lincoln University, which is a historically black college in Pennsylvania. As you may know, uh, there was a kind of US apartheid uh, in the United States. And what this meant was that black people had to develop their own universities, one of which was Lincoln University. As a matter of fact, Lincoln University also uh, educated a, a number of um, Namibian leaders, uh, Theo Ben Gurram, for example, who was for years the representative to the United Nations of colonized Namibia, was educated in the United States. A number of leaders of independent Africa were educated at Howard University in Washington, D.C., uh, another historically black college. Uh, they also educated a, a number of Caribbean leaders as well. And so Kwame Nkrumah was quite familiar with many of the Black American political class, uh, thinking of W.E.B. Du Bois, for example, who oftentimes is viewed as a father of Pan-Africanism, but uh, preceding Du Bois was Edward Blyton, B-L-Y-D-E-N. In fact, I, I interviewed the uh, his great granddaughter, who was a historian at George Washington University in Washington, D.C. Her name is Namata, N E M A T A, Blyton, B L Y D E N. You can find the interview on the Activist News Network site, because I do this radio program myself on a radio station in Los Angeles, California, kpfk.org. And Blyton, whose roots were in the Caribbean, uh, wound up uh, becoming an official in Liberia. You may recall that Liberia was a state started about two centuries ago by US enslavers who were trying to rid North America of the so-called free Negro population, that is to say the non-slave Black population and dumped them in Liberia, West Africa. And a very inglorious narrative began to unfold because what happens 
is that this population from North America begins to wage war against the indigenous population of that part of West Africa and set up a kind of uh, replica of what they had experienced in North America, except that this time they would be the exploiting class <laughs> as opposed to the exploited class. And that system was not sustainable and it led to a bloody coup and multiple conflicts and civil war from about 1980 into the 21st century. In fact, if your stomach can take it, you can go online and see a ghastly episode of many of the so-called America Liberian elite being lined up on the beach and shot uh, as a bloody chapter of the Civil War. In any case, uh, other than Edward Wilmot Blyton, you have Henry Sylvester Williams, who was a lawyer with roots in Trinidad and Tobago. Trinidad and Tobago is a Caribbean island off the northern coast of South America, about seven miles as the crow flies from Venezuela. And Henry Sylvester Williams also helped to organize one of the first Pan-African Congresses, which took place about uh, 120 odd years ago. And then of course, W.E.B. Du Bois, who was a mentor of Kwame Nkrumah. Uh, they collaborated on the fifth Pan-African Congress that took place in Manchester, England in 1945, which set the stage for the liberation of a good deal of Africa in the succeeding decade and a half. Kwame Nkrumah, you may recall, also during his brief reign from 1957 to 1966, uh, established Ghana as a haven for exiles, including Black American exiles. W.E.B. Du Bois wound up moving to Ghana in 1961, died there in 1963. His spouse, Shirley Graham Du Bois, came with him. After his death, she became the director of television in Ghana, trying to use television as an educational tool in African villages. I wrote a book about Shirley Graham Du Bois. I've written books about W.E.B. Du Bois too, you may know. And also Southern African exiles, Robert Mugabe of Zimbabwe met his first wife, Sally, uh, in Ghana. She was Ghanaian. So Kwame Nkrumah was overthrown in February, 1966, once again, uh, at the behest of the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency. Interestingly enough, the U.S. ambassador to Ghana at the time of the overthrow was a Black American, Franklin Williams, who denied any knowledge or complicity with regard to this episode. Uh, but uh, quite frankly, I am amongst those who do not believe him. And that speaks to another story, which is how what happens in the 1950s is that the United States finds it necessary to retreat from the more horrible aspects of U.S. apartheid. And the price of the ticket, so to speak, the concession that Black Americans have to deliver was to isolate socialist-oriented leaders, such as Paul Robeson, W.E.B. Du Bois, Paul Robeson, et cetera. The NAACP, which was the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, an organization that's still in existence, and Franklin Williams, the aforementioned Franklin Williams, played a key role in the NAACP. They accepted that bargain. They. Uh, Urged, ousted Du Bois from leadership. They tried to isolate the socialist oriented leadership because they thought they had a good deal. They thought that the deal was that you just get rid of these left wing black people, these socialist oriented black people, well, then everything would be fine and Jim Crow would disappear. But uh, it turns out that that was a terrible bargain. 
In any case, Kwame Nkrumah was overthrown in February 1966. He then uh, moved to Guinea Conakry uh, under the leadership of Sekou Touré, the founding father of Guinea Conakry, and died about six years later. Now, Muammar Gaddafi uh, was a patriotic uh, military man in Libya, North Africa. Uh, helps to overthrow the so-called royal family. I believe it was 1969 and rules until he in turn is overthrown by NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization led by the United States and France in 2011. As noted, if you can stomach it, you can find online his assassination. You may also know that France in particular had a material interest in seeing the ouster of Gaddafi because supposedly Gaddafi was supplying funds under the table illicitly to the then French leader Sarkozy. And Sarkozy was worried that this would be revealed and it could lead to a jail term for him. As you know, he's had all manner of legal problems since he left office. So he had a material interest in seeing Gaddafi disappear since dead men tell no tales. Uh, tragically and ironically, the president of the United States at that horrible moment was Barack Obama with roots in Kenya, East Africa. I wrote a book on Kenya, you may want to look at it. And I pointed out in that book that his father, Barack Obama Sr., he attended the University of Hawaii in the South Pacific. And on his way from Kenya to Hawaii, he stopped in Paris where he had an encounter with a notorious CIA man. Now, we don't know what happened in that meeting, but the fact that the meeting took place is well documented. And in any case, you may also know that Tom Mboya, M-B-O-Y-A, uh, who was curiously murdered some decades ago, was quite close to uh, Barack Obama Sr. And Tom Mboya, of course, was quite close to the United States quite close to uh, rather uh, unsavory US characters. That's all recounted in my book. You know, there's a saying in the United States and perhaps in your country too, that if you wanna keep a secret, publish it in a book <laughs> because people don't read. <laughs> so if you, if you have a big secret, publish it. Nobody, nobody will, never, will, never, will ever find out about it. In any case, um, Back to Muammar Gaddafi, uh, he was tr trying to leverage the vast oil wealth of Libya uh, on behalf of Pan-African unity uh, just before he was executed. The idea was afloat that CERT, S-I-R-T-E, would become a Pan-African headquarters, second to Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Uh, supposedly, Mr. Gaddafi was trying to move away from the dollar. You may recall that since the so-called oil crisis of 1973, when you had a conflict between Egypt and Israel, and as a direct result, there is a lot of upset and rancor in the Arab world, where a disproportionate percentage of petroleum is located. And the Saudis, Saudi Arabia, which is still the prime producer uh, of this commodity, moved to the petrodollar system, whereby if you want to buy oil, which is the lifeblood of a modern economy, which powers automobiles and trucks and airplanes, sometimes even fuels factories through furnaces, you have to have dollars. And the uh, United States can print dollars 
Um, others have to get dollars the old fashioned way. You know, you, you have to s sweat in order to get dollars. And supposedly both Gaddafi and Saddam Hussein of Iraq, which is an, another oil producing country, were trying to move away from that system and uh, perhaps not coincidentally paid with their lives. Today, as we speak, February 12th, 2023, uh, there is more talk about the Saudis moving away from the dollar. That's the import of President Xi Jinping uh, coming to Saudi Arabia a few months ago. Uh, we shall see what happens. The United States is obviously mired in a very deep crisis right now as a result of the conflict in Ukraine, their attempt to uh, boycott Russian energy, which then puts a premium on African energy, Niger Nigerian petroleum, Angolan petroleum, Algerian natural gas, et cetera, not to mention Libyan energy as well. And I should also mention in this context, since we're discussing Libya, that since the overthrow of Gaddafi, uh, Libya has been a disaster. There have been incredible stories of neo-slavery emerging in Libya. And Mr. Obama says that the aftermath of that Libyan misadventure was one of the biggest blunders of his administration. I, I would say not necessarily the aftermath, but the initiation of the overthrow of Gaddafi was a severe blow. And it also, I'm afraid to say, it should teach us the bitter but elementary lesson that even though many of us feel that the so-called lily white institutions like the presidency uh, should be desegregated, uh, that is to say that they should be open to any U.S. national, any U.S. citizen, uh, even one who is a descendant like myself of enslaved Africans, we should have no illusion with regard to whether or not that's the ultimate remedy, because clearly it's not. I mean, you can put a Black person in the White House, but if the underlying structures and institutions still remain, it's unclear if that will radicalize the structures and institutions in a progressive and democratic manner. Matter of fact, I would say it's not unclear. It is clear that it won't uh, produce in and of itself uh, positive results.